Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Claire Hall. I'm a senior associate in the data protection team here at VWV. Uh, next slide, please. So in this morning's session, we're going to be thinking about kind of GDPR five years on. So I can't believe it's been five years. It's flown by. Obviously, we've had a pandemic in that time, which has made things a little bit more interesting. Um, but, you know, that five years really has flown by. But we have learned an awful lot about GDPR in those five years. So this morning, I'm going to cover GDPR five years on the big picture to start off with. Then I will move on to everybody's favorite topic, which is data subject rights requests, and in particular, subject access requests, and some top tips I have for how to make dealing with those a little bit easier. Now, I can't promise too much. Um, then I'll move on to talking about what we have learned from ICO enforcement action, and hopefully how you can use those lessons to avoid ICO enforcement action. And then key lessons from the wealth of ICO guidance that has been published over the last five years. And then obviously the high risk, one of the high risk areas of data protection compliance is information security. So I'll cover off some, some advice on avoiding a data breach, um, but also obviously inevitably data breaches do happen. So also avoiding ICO enforcement action if a breach does happen. And then we'll kind of finish off by kind of doing a bit of crystal ball gazing into the future and have a think about reforms to data protection law, because there is currently a bill going through Parliament, which will make certain changes to the data protection regime. Next slide, please. Great. So kind of wanted to kind of just start off with an overview of kind of where we are, what's what's happened over the last five years. So I would say information security remains the area of greatest risk. One of the reasons for this is that data breaches are one of the areas most likely to cause harm to individuals. And when the ICO are thinking about an enforcement action, that is certainly something that they will take into account. Obviously, harm to individuals as well also has reputational consequences for your organization too. And people can bring claims for compensation over, over um, data protection non-compliance that leads to damage and distress to them as well. So, and a lot of those claims that we've seen have been related to information security breaches. So, so that probably remains the area of greatest risk, which is why I've dedicated a section this morning to that topic. Um, obviously, since um, the 25th of May 2018, when the GDPR became enforceable, um, the UK has left the European Union, which has had certain implications, obviously, for data protection law, because as many of you will know, the GDPR is a European regulation. Um, the uh, UK has luckily received an adequacy decision from the European Union. Now, what this means in practice is that data can flow freely between the UK and the EU without having to put certain measures in place to protect that data. And essentially the reason for that is that the EU have judged that the UK has adequate data protection laws of a similar standard to the UK, sorry, to the EU GDPR. One of the main things I'm going to talk about this morning is accountability and how important accountability is to your compliance. Um, that is definitely one of the areas where I see organizations fall down the most, actually, accountability. Um, accountability, for kind of those of you who aren't aware, is a requirement under the UK GDPR, and it requires organizations to demonstrate that they are complying with the law. So it's not enough to just comply with data protection law anymore. You also have to be able to demonstrate how you are complying. And I've got some advice for you um, around how to do that most effectively as well, which we'll cover off this morning. Um, and then finally, one of the areas that I advise on um, that keeps me quite busy, actually, is advising on data subject rights requests. Um, now, under the UK GDPR, there are a variety of rights that people have, and I will cover those off this morning. But subject access requests remain the most popular right. Um, the number of subject access requests that I've been advising on has um, steadily increased in number 
um, over the last five years. And I think people have learned more about what rights they have in their data. Next slide, please. So I think that's a really good place to start, actually, it is data subject rights, because these often cause the most headaches to organisations. Um, we do find that data protection rights are often used um, quite tactically by individuals when making complaints and grievances to organisations. So it's actually relatively standard now that um, I work quite closely with our employment law team because um, we find that people who are maybe going through an employment process, maybe they're thinking about taking your organisation to the employment tribunal, they will often make a subject access request fishing for information about things they think might help them. But it's not just about such access requests. I've also seen the other rights being used in this way as well. Notably, the right to erasure, to have information about them deleted, the right to object as well. So I think it might be helpful if we just start off by a bit of a refresher, because whilst I think a lot of you will be familiar with such access requests, the other rights might not be so familiar to you. So the right to erasure, um, sometimes known as the right to be forgotten, is a right that individuals have to have the personal data held about them deleted in certain circumstances. Now, just to reassure you, this is not an absolute right at all. Um, there are very good reasons why your organization would need to keep um, personal data about someone. So an obvious reason is you might need that data to defend yourself against claims by that individual. However, there are circumstances where it will apply. So, for example, if you have relied on the data subjects, the individual's consent to use their data, and they then withdraw that consent, the right to um, erasure does apply in those circumstances. So that's one of the reasons why I always kind of caution organisations about relying on consent if there is another lawful basis available. So remember, there are six lawful bases under the UK GDPR. Consent is simply one of them, and it's no better or worse than any of the others. The, the key is working out which is the most appropriate. Now, another right where um, which intersects very much with lawful bases under the UK GDPR is the right to object. So individuals only have the right to object if you are relying on legitimate interests or public task to process their data in a particular way. And again, not an absolute right to reassure you. So um, the right to object does not mean that the individual gets to control what you do with their data. But it does mean that if they flag something to you of concern, maybe they're concerned about you using their data in a particular way or maybe sharing it with particular people, that kind of thing. They are allowed to say, look, I'm concerned about this. I'd rather you not do it. That might count as a valid right to object. You would then need to do a balancing exercise, essentially and work out if their kind of objection is outweighed by your compelling legitimate reasons to use their data. And if it is good news, you have to let them know about that, but you don't have to stop using the data. So I want to flag the right to object because it's a right that is quite tricky to recognize sometimes. Um, so it is worth being aware of. Same with the right to erasure as well. Um, another right that we see exercised quite commonly is called the right to rectification. This gives individual the right to have personal data about them, which is inaccurate or incomplete corrected. So very closely ties to um, the um, principle under the UK GDPR of accuracy. Um, so right to rectification applies in those circumstances. I often see the right to rectification being exercised after somebody has received a subject access request response. Because sometimes people get a stress response and they don't like what they're reading about themselves. Now, that could be because the data is inaccurate, in which case, you know, perfectly valid reason to make a right to object, sorry, right to rectification. And you would obviously be required to correct it. But sometimes people object to opinions that have been made about them. That becomes slightly more complicated because accuracy is very much about whether something is correct as to a matter of fact. So opinions even if someone disagrees with an opinion, doesn't mean it's inaccurate. So the right to rectification, again, one that it's worth knowing about because I do often see that um, exercised following somebody receiving a subject access request disclosure. But I do want to focus on subject access requests for a large part of this section because I would say by far the most common right of all the rights um, that I advise on. If I think back to the last five years of all the matters I've advised on where a right has been exercised, 
I would say subdata requests probably account for about 90% of that advice that I've been giving. So just to remind everybody, a subject asset request um, is made when per a person asks for a copy of the personal data you hold about them. It doesn't have to be labeled as such. Um, they can simply ask for a copy of the data you hold about them. They don't need to use the word subject asset request or Article 15 of the UK GDPR or anything like that. Don't need to even mention data protection law. So it is worth making sure that you have staff training in place. And I'll touch on staff training in more in detail in a moment. Definitely have staff training in place so people can recognize when that right is being exercised. It is good practice to have a subject asset request form that people can use to exercise that right, but you cannot require people to use a form. In fact, you can't even require people to make the request in writing. So one of the changes actually when the GDPR came in is that previously subject asset requests had to be in writing. That's no longer the case. So somebody can over the phone to you or in person, um, make a subject asset request to your organization, to any member of staff as well, which is why it's so important to have staff training on these things so that everybody knows how to recognize one. You do need to prepare to receive one of these requests. I would be absolutely flabbergasted if anybody who's attending this webinar today, their organization has not received at least one subject asset request over the last five years. In fact, I imagine some organizations, um, larger organizations have probably received hundreds over the last five years. Do you make sure that you are putting in place measures to make dealing with a request easier when you get it? So kind of make hay while the sun shines, as, as it were. One of those main things to put in place now is staff training. So I've already mentioned that you need to make sure that every member of your organization knows how to recognize when somebody is exercising one of their rights in the UK GDPR, because a valid right can be made to anybody at your organization. That person, though, should not be dealing with the request themselves or the exercise of the right themselves. They should be passing it immediately to your data protection lead to deal with. I know some of the organizations attending this webinar today are quite large, so you might even have a whole data protection team that is responsible for dealing with those things. So make sure people know how to contact that team you know, and pass it on immediately, because obviously the clock starts ticking normally as soon as you receive that right. Staff training as well is really important around people knowing that how they are using personal data in a work context could be disclosable under a subject asset request. So it's really important to make sure that people are expressing themselves in writing or in recorded form in a professional way. I've had a number of requests come off across my desk where Unfortunately, somebody internally at the organization has made a comment which has been less than professional. And that's then put the organization in a very complicated situation when they've had to think about whether they need to disclose that to the individual in question. So if you can give staff training just around making sure what they are saying in emails, for example, are professional at all times. Because whilst we can find exemptions to withhold personal data in certain circumstances, you know, they are relatively limited and they normally are there for very good reasons, such as safeguarding, things like that. So yeah, just someone having a rant about somebody, unfortunately, there's no exemption for that. Staff training as well is really important around how you are storing personal data. So this applies to, well, most of the rights really under the UK GDPR. Um, if staff are not storing personal data in a logical way, it is going to make it much more difficult for you to find that personal data when you need it to respond to a subject asset request. Think about whether the data needs to be erased under a right to rectification, sorry, under a right to erase request. Think about whether it needs to be corrected under a right to rectification request. Um, so you should have procedures and protocols in place at your organization regarding where staff store personal data. It just makes life so much easier for your data protection team when you have to do this. Staff training as well is really important around personal devices and the use of personal devices. So you should have controls in place for information security reasons as well around staff only processing personal data for work reasons on your work systems. Or if you do allow staff members to use their personal devices, you should have a bring your own device or information security policy that covers off how they are to do that securely. I have advised a few organizations recently 
where staff members have been using kind of personal WhatsApp for work reasons. And this not only is a risk from a data protection, uh, information security perspective, also makes it more difficult. Um, let's say if that staff member leaves your organization, how is that personal data going to be um, collated as under a subject asset request if need be? How is it going to be erased if need be under a right to erasure request? So information security and data subject rights issues around staff members using personal devices or personal communication channels for work reasons. The last point on this slide relates to engaging with the requester. So do make sure that if you receive a right and it's unclear what the requester maybe is asking for, do engage with them. The ICO are very keen on this. They want to see that you are actually engaging with people when they're exercising their rights. And I know that can be difficult because, as I mentioned, rights are often exercised in relatively contentious circumstances sometimes. Um, but you do need to show willing to engage with them when they're exercising their rights. In particular, if somebody makes a subject asset request for a large volume of data, consider whether it's appropriate to go back to them to ask them to clarify what they are seeking. You are allowed to do that if you process a large amount of data about them and it's not clear what they specifically what they're seeking. So I, that's one of my top tips for dealing with subject asset requests actually is do go back, do engage with them, do go back to clarification if it's appropriate, because you can save yourself a lot of time, actually, if someone's made a really broad request, and often they're not interested in everything, they're only interested in specific things. So it is worth engaging with them around that clarification. Next slide, please. Okay, so when it comes to doing subject asset requests, um, I often get clients calling me in a bit of a panic because they've done a, a search across their entire email system or something like that just for the requester's name. And it's come back with, if they're an employee, it could come back with you know hundreds of thousands of emails if they've been with you for a very long time. So do think strategically about how to do your searches. Remember that under a subject asset request, somebody is entitled to a copy of their personal data and certain supplementary information as well, like why you're processing it, how long you're keeping it for. But when trying to find a copy of their personal data, doing a search across your entire email system for just their name is gonna bring back all sorts, including emails where they are simply CC'd. Now, whilst their name is personal data, that doesn't mean that the rest of that email contains their personal data. And people are only entitled to a copy of their personal data. They're not entitled to a copy of the original document that contains their personal data. Um, which means that if somebody is simply CC'd into an email, well, what's in there, their name, email address, that will probably be disclosed elsewhere. So you don't have to disclose every single copy of an email that they've been CC'd into just because it's got their name in it. Um, I know that sounds obvious, but sometimes people do get a bit concerned about splash requests for that reason. So think tactically about where their personal data that they are seeking is most likely to be found at your organization, which comes back to the point I was making a moment ago around the importance of thinking about where you are logically filing things. So if staff members are simply keeping emails in their inbox forever, that's not really gonna help you when it comes to looking for data under sub asset request. So make sure you know HR information should be contained in a particular place. Um, information about your customers or if you're a university, your students should be contained in that particular place as well. So the more structured you can be around how you are storing personal data, the easier it is to comply with data subject rights, in particular subject asset requests. I've also put good, keep good records is the next point on this slide. And the reason for that is, um, kind of comes back to the accountability principle that I will talk about in a bit um, more broadly, but it's specifically in relation to data subject rights. You want to keep a record of your thought process as you've been dealing with the request. So let's say you have gone back to the requester to ask them for their ID because you are concerned that it might be someone impersonating the individual. Obviously, for information security reasons, we want to be very, very clear. We are only giving the personal data to the individual themselves and not someone who's potentially impersonating them. So there are good reasons sometimes to go back and ask for ID. Keep a record of the fact that you did that. Keep a record of what ID you saw. Also keep a record of why you thought it was appropriate to ask for ID, because you shouldn't be asking for ID in all circumstances. If, a, if an employee, for example, makes a subject asset request using their work email account, I think you can be pretty assured that it is genuinely them making the request. It wouldn't be appropriate normally in those circumstances, unless you had particular suspicion that it wasn't them, to go back and ask them for, you know, to evidence their identification. So, Keep good records around that. 
if you go back asking them for clarification, make sure you're keeping the paper trail around, maybe the email exchange doing that for your records. The reason I'm suggesting this is that if the ICO ever do get involved, and the ICO sometimes do get involved in subject asset requests because it's the area they get the most number of complaints about, will just really help you to demonstrate to the ICO you did everything right. Now, one particular area where it's really important to keep records is A, what you disclosed to them in the end. So keep a copy of what you gave to the requester. Also, keep a copy of any, sorry, keep a record of any exemptions that you relied on, why you relied on those exemptions, and which what data you, rel you withheld based on those exemptions as well. Because again, sometimes the ICO don't get back to you regarding a complaint for a number of weeks or even months because they're receiving such a large volume of complaints. So it's good to keep records so that it just makes it easier for you to kind of explain yourself to the ICO. And then my last kind of tip on data subject rights is stick to your retention periods. When someone makes a subject asset request um, and if they do ask for a large volume of data, if you've just been universally keeping everything about them, even if you even though you didn't need to, it will make your life harder. So do think about sticking to those retention periods. You should have a retention schedule, which sets out how long you keep different types of data for. Um, but if you're just universally keeping everything for, you know, 20 odd years, um, it is going to make it more difficult if somebody makes a sort of asset request. Or even a right to erasure as well, or a right to rectification, because you have to go through and check that you have erased everything they've asked you to erase or corrected everything they've asked you to correct. But it's mostly an issue in relation to subject access requests. Now, I could do a whole webinar on subject access requests alone, um, but obviously I haven't got time to do that this morning. Um, but that's kind of just a whistle-stop tour of my kind of top tips on things that I've learned over the last five years from advising on a lot of subject access requests. Next slide, please. Okay, ICO enforcement. Okay, so obviously when the GDPR came in, there was a lot of fanfare around the fact that the ICO's enforcement powers were much, um, could be much more severe under the GDPR than they were under the Data Protection Act 1998. So under the Data Protection Act 1998, the fines were capped at half a million pounds. Obviously under the GDPR, they're much higher and can be as much as 4% of annual turnover. Um, so quite a lot. The ICO, though, were very keen when GDPR came in to reassure people that they were not going to be issuing million pound fines to every organisation that made a technical breach of the law. They are very keen to emphasise that they take action when it's appropriate and proportionate to do so. So actually, if you think about the number of um, fines you've actually seen over the last five years, it hasn't been that many. We're not talking about the ICO having issued hundreds of fines to organisations. So um, that's quite reassuring. The fines that they have issued tend to be for things around information security. That was at least the case initially. I have noticed that over the last maybe year to 18 months, we've started to see fines um, such as the one given to TikTok, which haven't been around security breaches and have been more around things like transparency, protecting children, um, and just general other harms being caused to people um, by data protection non-compliance rather than security breaches. I've also put PECA on the slide, and PECA, for those of you who know, don't know, is the Privacy and Electronic Communication Regulations. So these are the regulations that have been around for quite some time now, which govern the, amongst other things, govern the use of personal data for electronic marketing. Um, and also more broadly than that, actually, as well, even if personal data is not involved, they govern things like the use of cookies. Um, uh, so you, you can kind of blame PECA for the cookie ban you see, you see on every single website these days. So the ICO does take quite a lot of action around breach of the privacy and electronic communication regulations. So really where organisations are sending um, spam emails when they shouldn't be or call, cold calling people um, when they shouldn't be as well. Now, the ICO has a range of potential penalties at their disposal. These range from fines, which everyone tends to get quite excited about, down to things like reprimands, which is where the ICO writes to you and says, look, you need to do better next time. They don't take kind of, they don't require you to do anything that they would do under like an enforcement notice, but they basically tell you, look, you haven't done what you should have done and kind of give you a bit of a slap over the wrist, really. Um, 
So I mentioned enforcement notices there very quickly. So enforcement notices, I would say probably one step down from fines regarding the severity of action the ICO can take. The ICO can require you to take certain action. And for certain organizations, that can be quite um, an, a kind of dramatic thing for the ICO to do because they could actually require you to do something which could have implications for your business model, for example. So I'm thinking in particular here about the Experian enforcement notice that the ICO issued um, a few years ago. Experian have subsequently um, taken the ICO, ICO to the tribunal to try and uh, to get successfully actually to get some of that enforcement notice changed. But what, what the ICO did there was to basically tell Experian to change their practices, which I think had some quite um, severe knock-on effects to their business model. So it's not just about fines, I suppose, is the point I'm making. They can also do, as I mentioned, reprimands as well. I think on the next slide, please, we'll have a bit more on reprimands because last year the ICO changed their approach to enforcement. So John Edwards took over as information commissioner. I think it was at the start of 2022. So we have seen how he's kind of differed from his predecessor um, regarding enforcement. And one of the things that um, the ICO decided to do under his um, in his tenure, essentially, is a slightly different approach to public sector enforcement and also around reprimands as well. So reprimands are now, unless there's very good reason not to, they are now made public on the ICO's website. Obviously, that has reputational consequences for organisations. If you're not subject to the reprimand, though, it is a very useful resource to be able to look at where the ICO has given reprimands to other organisations. And this was really the reason why the ICO decided to make reprimands public, because it wanted that know-how around their enforcement action to be made public so organisations could learn from the mistakes of others. So there is a section on the ICO's website called Action We've Taken, and you can find the reprimands in there. So they also, at a similar time to making reprimands public, decided to take a slightly different approach to public sector enforcement. And I know quite a number of you attending the webinar this morning are from the public sector. And the ICO is very conscious of the um, implications of giving fines, particularly quite expensive fines, to the public sector at a time of economic uncertainty and a cost of living crisis. So what the ICO is basically doing now is it's saying that it might issue a reprimand rather than a fine, but it will sometimes say, had we not taken this approach, the fine would have been X amount. So the Department for Education got a reprimand a few months ago, and the ICO said that had they decided to give a fine, it would have been a fine in the region of £10 million. So you can see how actually this is a very beneficial approach for the public sector, uh, avoiding fines of that level and getting reprimands instead. Um, so that said, that's some good news. And I know a lot of you today, um, attending today, are from the public sector. But as I said, reputational consequences should not be underestimated by these reprimands now being made public. In the, in the vein of things being made public as well, the ICO um, last year started to publish data sets on its website around complaints and reported data breaches. Now, these data sets are not particularly easy to find on the ICO website, but if you know where they are, it's actually really interesting to download this. They're done as like an Excel spreadsheet and you can download them and see what they say about particular organizations. So the organization is named and then very, very brief details are given around the complaint. So um, again, it's only a few words actually, it's not a huge amount of detail but they are kind of putting the name of the organization there. So again, reputation of consequences. And that relates to self-reported data breaches, but also complaints the ICO have received as well. So it's something to be aware of. Um, and it kind of both just stresses the importance of why data protection is an area that your organization should be focusing on. Because whilst you might not get a fine, there are reputational consequences. You've got the management time and resources to spend on data protection complaints which often can be worse, um, worse than anything. When the ICO has taken action around information security, I very much notice that they do cross refer to the National Cybersecurity Centre. So the National Cybersecurity Centre are a government body who are tasked with um, providing guidance and support and particular tools to organisations around 
cybersecurity, as their name suggests. Now, the ICO obviously will have data protection, obviously have data protection expertise, but will have information security and cybersecurity expertise internally, but they do very heavily rely on the uh, National Cybersecurity Centre as well, because the whole reason for the National Cybersecurity existing is around cybersecurity. So, and the ICO and the National Cybersecurity Centre do work quite closely as well. So last month, actually, the ICO and the National Cybersecurity Centre published a joint article or a joint blog post about data breaches and the importance of being transparent and coming forward if you have experienced a data breach so that you are getting the help you need. So we do know that they do communicate. Um, one of the things as well, just to stress, that's very much come um, to the fore when reading about ICO enforcement action, because these things are all published on their website. You can all read them if you want to. Um, they do focus very much on accountability, and I'm going to cover off accountability in more detail in a moment. But essentially, when um, for those of you who have had the pleasure of having to report a data breach to the ICO using their data breach form, you will have noticed, for example, that one of the questions on that form is, were the staff members involved in this breach given training in the last two years? I think it is. So again, if you've got records of that training, makes it, which is part of your accountability, um, that makes it much easier to prove to the ICO you've done what you should have done. And where the ICO has taken action, it's often been around organisations who haven't had training in place, who haven't had the correct policies and procedures in place. And this is very strongly coming across in the reprimands as well that's been published recently. Next slide, please. So for that reason, let's now move on to talking about accountability. So. Um, over the last five years, obviously, those of us at BWV who specialise in data protection have been keeping a close eye on ICO guidance. Now, the first thing I want to say about ICO guidance is that it's not law. So this is very much the ICO's interpretation of what the law is. That being said, the ICO are, are required in the Data Protection Act, actually, to publish certain statutory codes of practice. So for example, they have to publish a code of, they've published a code of practice around data sharing, which is really worth having a look at. It's, it's quite a useful code of practice. So that kind of code of practice kind of sits above as it were, I think it's sitting above the other ICO guidance because it has more force. So the courts, for example, I think have to take into account these codes of practice. That being said, ICO guidance is still a really helpful resource, but remember it doesn't have the status of law. And sometimes the ICO do take quite a data subject friendly approach to the law as well. So other views are available, but because they are the regulator, I would strongly recommend taking their guidance seriously. Um, because it is useful to know how the ICO um, are interpreting the law and also what areas of law they are focusing on as well, because data protection law encompasses so many things it is useful to get a bit of a steer about where to focus most of your resources when it comes to data protection compliance. So accountability is about demonstrating your compliance. I'm afraid that does mean slightly more paperwork than it used to around data protection. Um, now, this will cover all sorts of things. Um, it will cover things like the policies and procedures you have in place, so the written guidance you have for staff. It will cover your records of training. It will cover the record you make when you share information with the police, for example, if they make a request to you and you decide to share information with them, you know, justifying why you decided that was the right thing to do. Um, it will cover data protection impact assessments that you've done. Um, data protection impact assessments, again, some people, the ICO, you can tell from their guidance, are very keen on. Um, the ICO have published um, quite lengthy guidance, actually, on data protection impact assessments, and then they often cross refer to that guidance in their guidance on other topics. Um, the ICO actually are required under the UK GDPR to publish a list of situations where they think or where they've decided a DPIA is actually required. So that guidance has a slightly different status as well, because it is guidance the ICO are required to do under the UK GDPR. Um, so data protection impact assessments, again, really important in demonstrating that you've thought about your data protection compliance. So even when they're not legally required, so they're legally required before doing processing, which is likely to lead to high risk to individuals. They can be a useful kind of tool, though, even though even if that threshold is not met, 
in just methodically thinking about data protection compliance. And again, part of your accountability is recording these things. So data protection impact assessment is quite a good way of recording your thought processes, recording kind of risks you've identified and how you've mitigated those risks as well. I mentioned retention schedules as well. So definitely have a retention schedule in place to demonstrate that you are not keeping personal data for too long. So it is a requirement in data protection law to only keep personal data for as long as you need to. You shouldn't just be blanket keeping everything indefinitely. Privacy notices as well. I'm hoping that most of you will have good privacy notices. Really important to be transparent with individuals about how you're using their data. And that kind of that all kind of falls within this proving your compliance points as well. The ICO guidance on accountability is referred, though they call it the accountability framework. And I, I quite like this guidance. It's not prescriptive. And that's one of the reasons I like it, because the ICO are very clear that accountability is never going to be one size fits all. So what is appropriate for one organization will not be appropriate for another, because you are going to be processing personal data in different ways. The risk profile of what you are doing with personal data will also be different. So I see a very clear, no one size fits all, but this guidance is really helpful in just giving you suggestions of things to think about. Um, the accountability framework as well um, is quite useful in just kind of almost using it as a checklist as well to make sure you've kind of covered off all the bases the ICO would be expecting you to think about. And then the final thing I wanted to mention on accountability is do make sure you have a data breach log. So you are actually required under the UK GDPR to keep a record of every single data breach, even if that is not reportable to the ICO. I've noticed recently the ICO have been focusing um, in their guidance on the riskier types of processing. So when GDPR first came in, they were very much focusing on the essentials, getting everybody up to speed on the data protection basics. Um, but now that that kind of bedrock of guidance is in place, they're moving on to the, the more, dare I say, the more interesting areas, the riskier areas. So they've recently updated their guidance on artificial intelligence, and they are now going through and publishing chapter by chapter the Employment Practices Code. So they've recently done something on workers, well, I say recently, it's a few months ago now, done something on workers' health data. So focusing on these risky areas of processing, Video surveillance as well. We've got really detailed guidance now. I think it was published last year on video surveillance, so CCTV, that type of thing. One of the, I mentioned codes of practice that the ICO are required to publish, like the data sharing code and the um, appropriate design code, otherwise known as the children's code. One of the codes of practice they are required to publish but haven't yet is direct marketing. Now, the reason the ICO haven't published this code of practice or finalised it yet, I should say, is because the law around direct marketing is probably going to be changing um, over the next year. And I'll cover that off in a moment when I talk about data protection reform. So they have said that they're holding off on that, um, publishing that or finalizing that until they're a bit more sure of what the law is actually going to look like in the next year or two. That being said, there is still a wealth of guidance on direct marketing on the ICO's website, and they've now created a hub to pull all of this direct marketing guidance together because previously it was a little bit scattered around their website. Um, direct marketing, just to clarify, that's actually quite a broad church, <clears throat> and it includes things like fundraising. I think we might have some universities attending this morning, and it would also include things like alumni engagement as well so it's not just commercial direct marketing it also includes promoting aims and ideals as well um, I know we've got quite a few public sector um, organizations attending this morning as well and the ICO have now specific guidance for public sector organizations on direct marketing so when basically working out when something is direct marketing and when something is more of a service message so letting people know about your services versus actually promoting maybe more commercial things and I mentioned already how, how kind of keen and close the ICO works with the National Cyber Security Centre. So the ICO will often cross refer in its security guidance to National Cyber Security Centre guidance. I strongly recommend that those at your organisation who are on the more technical side of information security, so probably your IT team, are intimately familiar with National Cyber Security Centre guidance. Uh, because as I said, the ICO will often hold you to account to the standard at which the National Cybersecurity Centre expects you to be taking measures. So National Cybersecurity Centre are real, like their website's full of really helpful resources. 
not just guidance either they also include things like tools like their early warning system which apparently um can can tell you about weaknesses in your system or if you may have been attacked cyber attacked um so yeah really worth being aware of the national cyber security center guidance and the other resources on their website as well next slide please Brilliant. So some top tips for avoiding a breach, but also avoiding ICO enforcement action. So I should say, you know, every organization out there, I'm sure, will have had some form of data breach at some point in the last five years. Now, it might not have been a serious data breach. It might not need to be reported to the ICO. But, you know, every organization has probably had an email sent to the wrong person or the wrong attachment sent to the wrong person. You know, these things are so easy these days, aren't they, to do. So obviously prevention is better than the cure, though. So let's try and prevent those breaches from happening in the first place. Uh, but when they do happen, we obviously want to prevent the ICO taking enforcement action against you. So I've got some do's and don'ts on this slide. Um, the first thing to mention is assess the risks. And this is very much part of accountability as well. So you need to be stress testing the measures that you have in place. So what risks are most prevalent at your organization is the question you should be asking. And this will vary obviously from organization to organization, but you need to be thinking, how is something going to go wrong? And don't feel as the in-house lawyer that you are doing this by yourselves. I'm a big believer that data protection is for everybody at your organization. So often the people on the ground have some of the best suggestions. And um, one of the purposes for me of data protection training for staff is to kind of build that culture of data protection compliance. So we want people to come forward to you as the in-house lawyer, as the data protection lead, as the DPO, for example, with, you know, oh, I'm a bit worried about this new system we've just implemented because I think this could go wrong. Or I'm a bit worried about the fact that these filing cabinets are left unlocked or, you know, that type of thing. We want people to come forward, um, not, not fearing reproach, um, to help you to assess the risks as one person in a large organization cannot do that you need help from your colleagues obviously once you've assessed those risks you then need to take action to mitigate those risks and coming back to accountability you need to be recording what you're doing as well so training is so important so training is important for multiple reasons Firstly, your staff members need to be trained on how to use and handle personal data to do their job in a way that protects that personal data. So keeps it secure, but also we want staff members to be able to recognize data subject rights. We want them to know when they're allowed to share data and when they're not, and when they should speak to somebody. We want them to know when they should come forward to the data protection lead and say, I think I might need to sign up to this new service, but I think there's a data protection implication because this provider will be using personal data on our behalf. You know, those of you who will, um, are data protection experts will know that that means that they're your process and there has to be a contract in place for certain provisions. We want all staff members to know the basics so that they know when to come forward to you. So that's the first thing. The second thing, which I've already mentioned, is creating this culture. We don't want people to fear retribution. If something has gone wrong, if someone has sent an email to the wrong person, happens from time to time. We want them to know that they can come forward without being rebuked because we don't want people. The last thing we want is for people to try and cover up their mistakes. We want people to come forward because if they don't come forward, you can't take action to put that breach right. Lessons cannot be learned from that breach if people are too scared to come forward and to admit and say, look, I hold up my hands. I did this wrong. So training is really important for that reason as well. We want that culture of data protection compliance. You must keep records of the training that you've given as well. So keep records of what the training content was. Ideally, we'd want to have some form of test at the end of the training, and that doesn't have to be a scary test. But if you do online training, for example, you could have kind of a multiple choice quiz at the end, that kind of thing. We actually have training here that we've designed a VWV for organizations, which has a test at the end. Um, and the way that we've designed this training is as well, that it's very easy for you to see who 
which staff members have done the training and when they've done it, what their pass rate was, that they passed the test, that kind of thing. Because as I said, if there is a data breach that needs to be reported to the ICO, one of the questions the ICO asks on their form is, did those staff members have training? So you need to have records in place to show that that training took place. Policies is the next thing. So policies around information security are so important. So we, you'd want, broadly speaking, to have um, a policy which is practical guidance for all staff in your organization about how to keep information secure. And then you probably will also need policies and procedures in relation to specific systems. You might also, if you're a large organization, want policies and procedures in relation to specific teams as well, um, particularly teams that are handling more high risk data. And again, having those policies in place not only educates your staff members so it makes a breach less likely, but it also shows that you were thinking about these things and taking measures to guard against them, which is what the ICO will be looking at if they investigate and if they think about taking enforcement action against you, or at least one of the things they'd be thinking about. So recording the measures you're taking, so, so important. And that's, again, why I'm a little bit of a fan of a DPIA, a data protection impact assessment, because it's a really useful way of methodically thinking about risks and recording what you're doing about it. I put cyber essentials on the list as well. So this comes back to National Cyber Security Centre resources. So Cyber Essentials is, a, I think it's free or it's not that expensive. And it basically um, allows you to kind of give you a little bit of reassurance that you are on the right lines regarding cyber, cyber security. I think there's also a Cyber Essentials Plus as well. So worth looking into that. And then just finally on the do list, do make sure you are keeping up to date with National Cyber Security Centre guidance and ICO guidance. Both organizations are publishing new guidance all the time. They're both very active in publishing things. And in particular, when it comes to cybersecurity, things are moving on really quickly. Um, the National Cybersecurity Center did a blog post, um, I think it was in March, about, for example, the, the cyber risks posed by generative AI, now that generative AI is really taking off because the National Cybersecurity Center flagged that actually generative AI if you know if in the or when in the hands of cyber criminals could make phishing emails or spam emails look more convincing easier to trick people into clicking on that link clicking on that attachment and um, that they shouldn't be clicking on so do make sure that the people at your organization who are responsible for cyber security the technical side of it are keeping up to date with national cyber security center guidance and then on the ICO side, that's more to do with your policies, your procedures, your organizational measures as well. So do keep on top of it. And then my do not list, just uh, relatively quickly. So when it comes to training, I'm a big believer that training needs to be, dare I say it, a little bit fun. Um, it should be engaging. It shouldn't be overly academic. I know us lawyers are really geeky sometimes because we just, we, that's how our brains work, isn't it? But, you know, people in practice who are trying to do their jobs, they're not that interested in like, the academic side of things. So make sure that the training is really practical. So they need to understand the essentials of the law. They don't need to understand kind of the ins and outs of everything, though, but they do need to understand what that means for them in practice. And that also applies to policies and procedures as well. I will quite often be sent policies and procedures to review by clients to suggest amendments. And one of my bugbears is where a policy looks more like a legal essay than it does an actionable thing or an actionable procedure that staff members can actually follow in practice. So whilst it needs to accurately reflect the law, a policy or procedure should not just simply set out what the law is. It needs to go a step further and say, this is the obligation. This means we need you to do X, Y, and Z. So how, for example, are staff members to work from home securely, that type of thing. Um, do not ignore your own policies either. Do make sure that staff members have read them. Again, I would suggest keeping records that staff members have read your policies. I know some organizations even go as far as making staff members sign the policy to show that they've read it as well. And please, I know I've talked about National Cybersecurity Center guidance mostly being for your technical IT people, but do not assume security is just an IT issue. It is very much not. It is something for everybody in your organization. There is definitely a human element to cybersecurity in terms of, you know, we all need to know how to recognize those or try and recognize those phishing emails that 
might da download malware, for example, onto your systems, you know, not to click on the link if you're unsure, that kind of thing. So it's not just an IT issue. And then the other two really things are just kind of to say, look, don't fail to record your steps. I know it can seem like a burden and you've already got so much paperwork as part of your job. I appreciate that. But just taking the time to methodically record what you are doing around data protection compliance will just stand you in really good step, stead if and when something does go wrong. So just don't fail to prepare because, as I said, I think every organisation in the country would have had a data breach of some description in the last five years. These things do happen, so we need to prepare to deal with them. Next slide, please. So I'm going to finish today's session by talking about data protection reform. So some of you may be aware that the Data Protection and Digital Information Bill is currently going through Parliament. So just to recap where we are with data protection law at the moment. <clears throat> so we have the UK GDPR, which is the kind of the UK version of the EU GDPR that used to apply when we were in the EU. And essentially, when we left the EU, it kind of got copied and pasted, technical term, into UK law with some UK specific things added. But broadly speaking, the UK GDPR is very, very, very similar to the existing GDPR that still applies in the EU. That then is supplemented by the Data Protection Act 2018. Now, it is supplemented by, so those two pieces of legislation work together. It's not the case that the Data Protection Act includes the GDPR. They are two separate pieces of legislation that work together. Then we also have the Privacy and Electronic Communication Regulations, which I've mentioned as well, um, which kind of interact with those two pieces of data protection legislation as well. But PECA is much broader than data protection law. Um, and essentially what the plan is, is that the government wants to make those three pieces of legislation more user friendly, more business friendly. The government is very conscious of the burden placed on organisations, particularly smaller organisations around data protection compliance. So this bill, the Data Protection and Digital Information Bill that's going through Parliament at the moment, the plan is that it will tweak those pieces of legislation to make things slightly easier for organisations. Now, the government is treading a very fine line here because the very first slide in this session referred to the fact that we have something called an adequacy decision from the EU. That means that the EU have judged that in the UK, we have law which is essentially equivalent, doesn't have to be identical, but essentially equivalent to the protections given under the GDPR. Um, so what the government are doing is they're trying to tweak but not to amend so much that we risk losing that adequacy decision. And various different people have different opinions on whether the data protection bill that's going to Parliament at the moment risks that adequacy decision. Some people say it does risk it, some people say it doesn't. Um, so that's, but that is something the government are definitely aware of. And I understand as well that the government have been in communication with the EU about these plans to try and ensure we keep that out of position because it is well, quite important for the economy that data can flow between the EU and the UK. So I can't in the kind of five minutes I have left cover all of the data protection reforms in the bill, but I just wanted to kind of very briefly touch on a few of them that I think are really interesting. So at the moment, certain organisations have to have someone called a data protection officer. Some of you may actually be the data protection officer for your organisation. So all public authorities have to have a data protection officer. And then if you're not a public authority, if you're doing certain types of high risk processing, you have to have a data protection officer. Under the new bill, this data protection officer role is amended, really. I wouldn't say it's replaced full scale, but it's amended to be something called the senior responsible individual. Now, the main change is that the senior responsible individual, um, broadly speaking, has to be part of your kind of senior management. The good news though, is that that senior responsible individual can, I think, delegate their tasks. So, because particularly in a large organization, you wouldn't have one person responsible for data compliance anyway. You'd probably have a few people in a team. Those tasks can be delegated, but ultimately it's the senior responsible individual who is responsible for securing that those tasks are, are done, essentially. 
So this is a potential change. Le legally, it's a change. How much of a change it actually ends up being in practice, I think we need to wait and see, because ultimately there needs to be somebody, even if you're not required to have a senior responsible individual, even if you're not required to have a DPO at the moment, there should still be somebody responsible in your organization for managing gauge protection compliance, and that, that fact is not going to change. The next thing I want to talk about is legitimate interest. So as I mentioned earlier, there are six lawful bases for processing personal data. One of those is legitimate interests. At the moment, if you want to rely on legitimate interests, you have to do a balancing exercise. Um, essentially, you can't rely on legitimate interests if your legitimate interest is outweighed by the rights and freedoms of the data subject, the individual who's data the processing. I should also say, I know there's quite a few public sector organizations on the, um, on the webinar today. And obviously, you can't rely on legitimate interests. I think it's when performing your public tasks. So I know it's more limited for you. But legitimate interests does still apply to most organizations. The government, in its attempt to try and make these things easier to deal with, is essentially saying that for certain things um, will be, I think the term is recognise legitimate interest. So you won't have to do that balancing exercise for certain things where the government thinks it's so obvious you should be able to rely on legitimate interests. So that's another interesting area which might make life easier as well. Complaints handling. So I mentioned that the ICO received tens of thousands of complaints every year. They do try and encourage organisations to resolve things with the complainant themselves before they get involved in a detailed way. That The changes under the bill will kind of put that on a statutory footing. Um, so you will actually be required to have measures in place to facilitate the making of complaints. And the ICO in most circumstances won't look at the complaint until the person has gone through your complaints handling process. So again, how much of a change that will be in practice it remains to be seen, but it obviously is, will be if it goes through a legal change. One of the focuses of the government is making sure that um, organisations don't have to have unnecessary and burdensome paperwork. And I know I spent most of this webinar talking about paperwork, um, but one of the things that you do have to have in place at the moment is a record of processing activities. As drafted at the moment, the bill says that you only have to have a record of processing activities if you carry out processing which is high risk. Now the ICO has asked for more clarification from the government on what counts as high risk in this context, um, but that could be good news as well, that those records of processing you have might only need to be maintained in relation to certain types of processing. Again, there's a little bit of, un well, I don't think that it's totally clear at the moment um, what high risk means. I also don't think it's totally clear at the moment um, whether you have to have a record of processing activities for everything if you carry out any high risk processing or if it's just for that high risk processing. So hopefully as the bill continues to go through Parliament and we get more ICO guidance on it as well, that hopefully will become clearer. But potentially some good news there because I know that doing records of processing activities can be quite a laborious process. And I'll just finish up by mentioning direct marketing, including fundraising. There are plans to make it easier for um, organizations to send direct marketing um, by relying on something called the soft opt-in, even if um, they haven't obtained the contact details during the course of a sale or negotiations for a sale, which is the current reason for being able to rely on the soft opt-in. So at the moment, you need consent before sending um, electronic marketing by electronic means, so emails, text messages. There's an exception to that, colloquially known as the soft opt-in, which means that um, if you obtain the person's contact details during the course of a sale or negotiations for a sale, and you gave them the opportunity to opt out, you don't need their full consent. But because it only applies when you obtain the contact details during the course of a sale or negotiations for a sale, that's no use to certain organizations. So um, I know some universities attending this morning. So alumni, for example, if you want to promote your next alumni reunion, that does count as direct marketing, but you're unlikely to obtain the contact details during the sort of course of a sale or negotiations for a sale. So there is an attempt to kind of broaden out that soft opt-in so that if you obtain the contact details um, by other reasons, essentially, if they, a person expressed an interest in supporting you, that might now be a reason to be able to send them um, direct marketing without their full consent, provided you gave them that opt-out when you first got the contact details. So again, one of the areas where I think it's really helpful to have ICO guidance on how they're planning interpreting the law 
And this, these things as well might change a little bit as the bill continues to go through Parliament. We don't at the moment know when it will become law. It's just gone through the report, the committee stage, and it's about to go to the report stage, but it hasn't gone through the House of Lords yet. So there's definitely still time for amendments to be made to the bill. As I said, it, parts of it have been a little controversial. So interesting to see what amendments are made, if any, as it goes through or it gets royal assent. And apologies, I've gone slightly over time, as I always do, but we do still have time for questions. So I'll move on to the next slide. And I will bring up the Q&A. So thank you very much for those of you who have asked questions. I'm just going to take a moment to have a very quick look at the questions. So we've got a question about subject assets requests. Um, and I'm conscious that you can't see the questions, so I'll kind of summarise them before I answer them. So it's a question about kind of the fact that under a subject asset request, people are entitled to their personal data, but there can sometimes be confusion around what counts as personal data. So personal data is information that relates to an individual from which they are identified or identifiable. So even if someone's name's not included, if you can work out it's them and it relates to them, it will still be their personal data. I do sympathize on the confusion around personal data because this relates to LIM, I think is quite confusing. Um, the ICO do have quite detailed guidance on it, but ultimately you do need to make a judgment call on whether something is someone's personal data or not. Um, I do sometimes say if you get three data protection lawyers in a room and ask them if something's personal data or not, you can get three different answers. It is an area that is quite tricky. I would say for the purposes of dealing with such asset requests, it comes down to justifying the approach you have taken, making records of the approach you've taken. So if something is um, borderline, I think as long as you've taken a reasonable view and you're not intentionally trying to withhold things, I think the ICO would be relatively pragmatic about it. I have a question here, which is, do you know of any circumstance in which the ICO has taken any enforcement action against a school? Really interesting you mentioned that because I think it was last week the ICO published a reprimand um, against a school regarding um, it was a personal data breach. It was a security breach in relation to, I think, um, reading between the lines of the reprimand, I think what had happened is um, some data got shared on an electronic whiteboard in front of pupils that shouldn't have been shared. So, yes, I am aware of the ICO taking or issuing reprimands to schools. Um, no school has received a fine, though, under the UK GDPR, um, and no school has received an enforcement notice either. The ICO are relatively pragmatic uh, when it comes to schools, but no reprimands um, I know have been issued to schools. Well, at least one was um, one was published last week, and I know that a couple of schools got reprimands at the beginning of 2020 regarding the publication of photographs as well. That was published on the ICO website at the beginning of 2020. So I've got a question. Is it correct that the statutory role of data protection officer has been abolished? Um, that question might have been um, asked before I covered it off. So just to clarify, the bill replaces the concept of data protection officer with this senior responsible individual role. But the senior responsible individual can delegate their tasks. So I think that means possibly that if you are not part of senior management, you can probably still continue to do data protection compliance as part of your organization, but you would be reporting to somebody at the very highest level of your organization, which again ties in with what the ICO have been saying for a while now that data protection compliance is a boardroom issue is the words that they use. So whilst you might have a team or a person who's slightly more junior managing compliance on a day to day basis, they should be accountable to somebody more senior. So again, it's difficult to say at the moment what this senior responsible individual role is going to mean in practice. Have any sanctions been issued against universities? Not recently is my answer to that. I can't hand on heart say ever, but not recently. So we've got a question about SARS. So I mentioned that correspondence between colleagues 
um, expressing an opinion about the individual making this art might be disclosable under a subject asset request. Yes. So um, opinions about somebody is their personal data. So if I write a colleague, uh, sorry, if I write an email to a colleague um, expressing my concern that one of my colleagues is not doing their job properly or they're underperforming, that kind of thing, and the person I'm expressing that opinion about makes a subject asset request, that is that person's personal data. So we would need to consider if it's disclosable. We might be able to rely on an exemption. Um, but um, it's not universally going to be disclosable, but we would have to identify an exemption for it not to be disclosed. So one of that, um, one of those exemptions could be the third party data exemption, or it could be the management planning exemption, but you need to think very, very carefully about applying those exemptions. But broadly speaking, an opinion about somebody expressed by a colleague is that person's personal data. Um, Guys, I'm so sorry, we seem to have run out of time. Um, my contact details are on the next slide. My mobile number's on there. I'm always happy to hear from people. So please do get in touch if you have any more questions that I haven't got around to answering. So sorry about that. There's just so much to talk about in data protection law at the moment. So I think we'll leave it there. Thank you very much um, for attending. Really appreciate your time this morning. So lovely to see data protection is such a popular topic. Um, I hope you have a really good rest of the day.